Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you who are joining us remotely, this is Senate Education. It is Wednesday, uh, February 20th, uh, I'm sorry, February 10th. We are going to start uh, the day with uh, Carolyn Weir. Ms. Weir, thanks for joining us. Uh, Ms. Weir is from the um, McClure Foundation. And as many of you will recall, the McClure Foundation gave uh, Vermonters a very generous gift last year, which uh, hopefully she'll take the time just to, to bring us back to that moment, why they did what they did, as well as some of the outcomes that they witnessed from having done that. This is, I would say, uh, a continuation of the conversation that we have all had around what might we be doing in the future for uh, Vermont students and with regard to giving them greater access to higher education. Uh, along those lines, I just wanna let uh, senators know that uh, Senator Hooker, the vice chair and I had some time this afternoon with the money chairs in both the House and the Senate talking a little bit, uh, they were very interested and Senator Hooker, please uh, add to this or, or, or correct this if I'm getting any of it wrong. I think they were uh, very pleased to see uh, our general um, take uh, from yesterday's testimony. Um, they are uh, going to be partnering with us going forward again on how best to uh, allocate, direct, recommend funds going in certain directions from the $128 million that education is getting in CARES funds, some of which um, it's some of which we can be directed, some of which cannot be directed, but Senator Kitchell is interested in us at the very least making certain that the agency of education, our schools, mental health professionals, Vermonters in general know where we believe uh, fin uh, financial support is going to be needed. So we will continue those conversations. Uh, I've asked Secretary French to come in on Monday uh, for in, that'll give us an opportunity to share with him some of our thinking that came out of yesterday's discussion and also hear from the Agency of Education. What we did not have an opportunity to talk to Senator Kitchell and others about, which hopefully will uh, I'll have time either later today or tomorrow. And that brings us back to really what we're talking about right now. And that is what can we do uh, with some of these CARES dollars or general fund dollars uh, or education dollars, but likely general fund or CARES, federal funds, to again, give our students greater access to higher education. Uh, Senator Hooker, am I missing anything? Did you wanna add anything? Uh, no, just that um, it was clear that, you know, we only have control over a certain amount of the money. Uh, much of the, the funds would go to the schools and uh, we were hoping that we could have some direction as to how that would be spent, but we can't really tell them what to do with it. Right. And to quote Senator Kitchell, she's hoping to use the bully pulpit in some ways, uh, get this out there that these are the needs that uh, policy committees have identified um, and, uh, and, and sort of force some of those conversations. So with that, uh, Ms. Weir, thank you again for taking the time to be with us and for your outreach and uh, everything that you and the McClure Foundation have done for Vermonters. I thought uh, a great way to start would be for you to just tell us a little bit about yourself as well as um, the history behind the grant, what you did, what, why you did it, um, and uh, we'll have a conversation. Great. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and the committee for welcoming me to testify about what we've learned from our graduation gift to the Vermont High School class of 2020. For the record, my name's Carolyn Weir. I'm here on behalf of the McClure Foundation, where I serve as executive director. Um, as it's helpful, I invite you to refer to the three-page fact sheet on the initiative that I've submitted for today's testimony, um, which I can also drop in the chat if helpful. I have about six, seven minutes of testimony to share, and of course, welcome questions um, during or, or after. We are a 25-year affiliate of the Vermont Community Foundation. We've spent the past decade or so exclusively focused on workforce development and supporting college and career training systems in ways that promote equity and resilience. So when the scope of the pandemic became clear last spring, including signs of mass deferments and post-secondary continuation among those seniors approaching high school graduation, we asked ourselves 
a question. In this time of uncertainty, what could we do to offer graduating seniors an easy option for continuing their education and then behind the scenes support a relational handoff from high school-based counselors to college-based academic and career advisors who could help chart next steps. So keeping to our design values of hope and simplicity, in terms of both messaging and access, we landed on a graduation gift to the entire Vermont high school class of 2020 of one free course of their choosing at CCV last fall. So our gift covered tuition and all fees associated with any course a student chose to take including courses that are part of shorter term certificate programs. And given all of the uncertainties that were in play last year and quite frankly, continue to be in play this year, we weren't sure how many students would take us up on the offer. Um, it was just an idea and we were trying to do the right thing by young people. By September, over 600 students had enrolled in their free course, representing over 10% of graduates statewide and double the typical enrollment of this cohort at CCB. This at a time when first year enrollment at community colleges was down about 20% nationally. And for me, this, this is the headline. Enrollment doubled when new enrollment nationally at community colleges plummeted. Now, can we credit all of that to the grad gift I imagine not, but it's clearly, um, it's clearly part of the story. And as you know, Vermont has long been an outlier nationally in terms of the percentage of the general fund allocated to public higher education and in terms of the tuition cost of public colleges generally and the community college in particular. And those are conditions we believe have impacted Vermont's demographics, the credentialing of Vermont's workforce. So to see Vermont profiled nationally as a bright spot in terms of community college enrollment last fall was really something. To us, the scale of enrollment in this initiative demonstrates that when the public's perception of cost barriers are removed, Vermonters enroll. Also, the perception of ease of access matters a lot, especially at a time like this. So early demographics data confirmed that the gift benefited students from all backgrounds, about half say they would be first in family with a degree. Um, interestingly enough, Orleans County had the highest enrollment rate relative to its young adult population. Um, and we have just heard in so many ways from students and parents that the gift relieved financial stress, helped clarify career interests and um, abilities, including college going abilities, and encouraged or convinced these young adults to continue their education amid so much disruption. So um, a student named Nick said college was something he dreamed about but never thought he'd be able to afford. He's from a low income household, quote, every dollar counts. He took two CCV courses um, last fall, in including intro to visual communications. And he said college felt manageable because half of his courses were paid for. He was working at the time as a, a full-time personal care attendant while taking the courses, and his dream is to become a graphic designer. So just recently, we um, had access to new course success data, uh, student survey data. Um, and so we now know that of the 1,200 or so CCV courses in which these students enrolled last fall, 90% were completed about 70% were completed successfully. And what matters the most to us is that 80% of surveyed students interacted with their CCB advisor during the fall semester. Um, the large majority of those meetings involve discussion or development of plans for next steps in education or career development. And 81% of surveyed students indicate they plan to continue their education. As I read that, I think that means you know, in the next year. So looking back, we point to three factors in the early success of this initiative um, or this idea. Number one, the core design values were hope and simplicity. Every single component of this initiative was designed to inspire hope and to be really easy to access and to understand. The scholarships were first dollar in, um, they were only available at CCD. 
students could choose any course available at CCB. Every single person who graduated high school um, in Vermont in 2020 was eligible. And we believe that structuring the gift is an easily understood and universal opportunity for students of color to take up across the board. Our messaging was very simple. It was positive. We told young people we believed in them and we thought they deserved something they could count on in this time of uncertainty. Number two, um, in terms of the, the factors that we think contributed to the take up at the scale that we saw was that we partnered with an institution that embraced a really big idea on a really short timeline and was positioned to quickly scale its courses and its supports. CCV was um, just ready to serve. They're Vermont's access institution, right? They enroll the greatest number of Vermonters of any college in the state. Becoming a CCV student is easy, so is transferring CCV credits, which made them the logical choice of partner in a continuation initiative. And number three, um, number three of three, we ensured extra supports for CCV and for students, like um, some nominal funding to help administer and evaluate the initiative and incentives for students to connect with academic advisors, career consultants, peer advisory groups. So all in the 2020 grad gift cost $655,000. Um, I think it's worth noting that Historically, the McClure Foundation uh, is not a scholarship funder, but we have come to believe that scholarships are a particularly useful tool during the pandemic for inspiring public hope in the value and accessibility of college yeah. and career training. Now, we, we dipped into, uh, into our invested assets, almost double what we budgeted in 2020 uh, in order to make it happened and what we learned has helped us clarify our vision of what's possible in Vermont, which is guaranteed affordable college and career training options that are well messaged, easily understood and accessed that lead to good jobs and create more equity and resilience in communities. And while scholarships are a tool that philanthropy has long leaned on, I'm not sure that we see scholarships alone as a systemic long-term approach for affordability, unless they're paired with significant direct investments, including tuition reductions in the places where students who are least likely to continue are most likely to go. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony and I welcome any questions, um, any questions that you have. Great, well, first of all, again, um, Thank you. It what it's incredible uh, and clearly had uh, incredible results. Um, and you know we are we are looking also now to see if there are ways that we can continue this kind of work. Um, so in that way, also I think it has us thinking. Of course, that it would be um, one of the things that you said at the end there was that you feel scholarship isn't usually part of the McClure Foundation work. Uh, but in this particular case, given the pandemic, you decided to move in this direction. Um, and it sounded like this kind of investment was, per, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I, in a way I'd love to be wrong, that this was a one-time thing. Uh, and for you to do additional um, scholarship support in any way, you would also be looking for the state to partner to actually lower the tuition in some ways or, or look for perhaps the state to invest in other ways in, in CCB. Am I uh, articulating that correctly? I think so, um, Senator Campion, and I can, um, I can walk through a couple of, of those. Um, yes, I think, as I mentioned, right, we are historically not a scholarship yeah. Um, funder, although we do believe that scholarships are a useful tool during the pandemic because they are a mechanism for inspiring so much hope broadly. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, a the reason that we don't see scholarships alone as a or the systemic approach for college affordability, um, especially from a policy perspective, is that they just don't fundamentally lower tuition rates across the board, right? And so they're limited in their ability to change the public's perception of affordability in a state with incredibly high tuition. 
Um, yeah. Again, yeah. so that's that's part of why um, we would love to see systemic investment in the institutions and places where the students who are least likely to continue are most likely to go. I think there are ways to make institutional investments that drive down the cost of enrollment for everyone. And yet, um, this is a this is a pan pandemic, and in 2021. Um, the conditions of uncertainty um, in families and the labor market in terms of how college and career training are delivered are continuing. And so, yes, I think Vermonters do deserve extra one-time enrollment incentives this year that inspire hope about the value of college and career training. Absent that, national trends, um, it seems to me pretty clearly indicate we'll see a lot of deferred continuation and stopped out students. I think before I turn it over to everyone, uh, I just want to mention the one thing that was incredible to me is for so long I've thought, um, it, you know, that, you know, we, we have again this high graduation rate from high school. And then, you know, a lot of students don't continue on to higher ed. And, and I think in some ways one thinks, and there could be some issues with preparedness at the pre-K through 12th grade, there, there might be some issues, but one of the things that you've shown me is that it's likely even more than that, uh, or maybe even not that, it is about the financial expense. It is about um, a family sitting there, even, you know, you're, you're, you're a solid student, you've worked hard, but you look at these costs, you're a first generation college student, and you um, and to start that kickstart that process is really hard. So I think the other thing that this grant this gift has shown us is that you know it so much of it is about accessibility and the lack of accessibility financially. So thank you, Senator Perchlick. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you? Yeah, I'm ready. I just had a flag. Oh, oh no problem. Um, Go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Weir, uh, for that. Testimony and for the it's, it's a good example of creative philanthropy, but I, I hear what you're saying about long range institutional investments. I run a, a fund for the state and we're, you know, similar looking where we would we try to invest our money in things that, that do market transformation and things like scholarships, I would not say is doing market transformation, but I think it is a, a creative solution for the times. One question that I have that maybe is not really for you, maybe it's for President Judy or something is, you know, what, what has been the impact of the other students that go to CCV of, of, of having, I guess, maybe not so much your scholarship. So maybe it's not an appropriate question. I'm thinking more of the, of the, all the high schoolers that are going, I um, mean, I guess new high schoolers that you guys help support is, is a little different, but I don't know if you've had any did any of your data gathering from the gift talk about other other benefits other than the, the students that took the took advantage of it? Does that make sense? In terms of um, Senator Perch, like influence on aspirations for other classes or participation in concurrent enrollment opportunities like dual enrollment in early college? Or are you thinking something outside of those lines? Or even was, was the, did classroom discussions become more dynamic? I mean, yeah, yeah, bigger, bigger classes or just, you know, to help the institution. Yeah, I guess any, anything that you guys looked at or you guys were really focused on the, the impact of the kids that you know, we were really focused on the impact of um, this cohort of 600 to 650. Um, but I think what was clear to us is that CCV with its 20 plus year history of online learning, its set class size, the work that it had already done to build out both academic supports, but also non-academic supports like career consulting was just ready to scale. So um, I shouldn't have been surprised by the degree of responsiveness of, of CCV. They've been our cornerstone grantee partner for 10 years, um, but we went from idea to launch public announcement with the governor in 10 days and CCV's responsiveness as an institution and their ability to scale. Um, I can't imagine being matched. Senator, did you have a follow-up question, Senator Persley? No, okay, Senator Lyons and then Senator Hooker. Uh, thank you, this is really um, great, great to hear. Uh, and I'm a strong supporter of CCV, so you've just reinforced that support. Uh, 
the, I do have a question. As you, uh, you said that 70% of the students passed their classes and that's probably a very, that's good. Um, when they, when you finished uh, talking with students and as they came out of this experiment, I call it an experiment, but this experience maybe, did you do a thorough sort of exit in interview uh, to try to understand what else besides scholarships would A, have attracted them into the academic environment after high school, and then B, what might help them succeed uh, in it while they're at the institution or to continue on? Uh, I mean, obviously, as we all know that CCV has very strong non-academic supports, but perhaps this little cohort might have offered something further. And I don't know um, if you did that type of analysis afterwards. Thank you for the question, Senator Lyons. I think the answers are broadly yes, no, and yes. So yes, we um, uh, built a survey for students about the experience um, and about the influence of this free course on their plans. And we incented um, participation in and completion of that survey. Um, and as a part of that process, have identified students willing to participate in things like focus groups to tell us even more about their experience. Um, we did not ask specifically your first question, but we did ask specifically your second, which is essentially um, in what you, you, the student have told us is your plan for next steps, including continuing in education, continuing in education and working, working, taking care of family, et cetera. What help do you need to take that next step? Is it completing FAFSA? Is it help finding a program? Is it help transferring to another institution? Is it help finding a job? Is it help completing a resume? So it's that type of information that is helping inform um, how CCV and philanthropy broadly continues to support this cohort as we um, also take a look at this idea um, as a pandemic era approach for supporting continuation. Senator Hooker. Thank you, Senator Campion, and thank you, Ms. Weir. Uh, this is fabulous. And, you know, I wish we could give all our kids gifts like this every year. But uh, uh, I have a question about the application process to get involved. You said 600 kids, about 10% of our grads. Is that 10% of the grads? Uh, how easy was the application process? Uh, I think that uh, even the idea of filling out an application to go to college is a deterrent for some kids. And I'm just curious to know that. Secondly, uh, the follow-ups as far as the kids are concerned, and you, you mentioned that about, you know, what are your next steps? How easy would it be for this cohort to continue at CCV? What would they have to go through? And thirdly, just a comment that I think the facility of uh, online courses for this generation makes a huge difference. It wouldn't to me because I'm afraid of online stuff, but kids are, you know, the digital natives uh, can participate with a lot of uh, cumin and, and uh, expertise that perhaps would, is something that we need to um, consider. Although CCV has been doing it for a long time and, and uh, maybe we just need to expand on that. Thanks for those um, questions, Senator Hooker. In terms of the application process, um, you know, the Community College of Vermont is Vermont's access institution. So the fewest barriers to application and entry of any institution um, in the state. So no application fees, no essays. Um, and that was a big part of again, why we selected CCB as the single institution to partner with in this continuation, um, in this continuation effort. In terms of um, continuation, um, like all CCB students, this cohort of 600 was supported in um, taking their best next step inclusive of continuing at CCB. Um, from what I understand from CCB, Final data on continuation will be available soon once colleges share their enrollment data post ad drop period with the National Student Clearinghouse. Senator Campion, you probably know a lot more about that than I do. Um, we'd be thrilled, I think, to see something um, 
in the range of 50% continuation this spring semester, given the uncertainties still in play and the fact that this was a first dollar in fall semester offer, which means that many of the students who um, took us up on this offer may have had no plan, um, not completed FAFSA, not explored eligibility for a Vermont State Grant, and may have received that support um, over the course of the fall or spring to complete FAFSA for the first time, and maybe thinking about continuation in terms of fall 2021 when those supports go into effect. Um, and um, I fully agree with you on online learning. We were um, hearing from young people that that modality worked well for them. I think in part because CCV managed expectations early and well um, in making the call to go almost completely um, online, uh, online early. And of course their track record um, in that space is, is a long one. Ms. Weir, I'm wondering if, I'm sorry, Senator Hooker, did you have a follow-up? Okay, uh, can you say something about uh, where, how was it advertised and marketed? Was that left with CCV? I was just curious how Orleans County uh, ended up using it a lot. So how, was that something that in the end, it just uh, was, you know, the responsibility of CCV? You know, it was, it ended up being such a hopeful announcement yeah. at such an uncertain time that honestly the news spread like wildfire. That's I think in true. hindsight, we, um, and this, this idea uh, wasn't conceptualized until maybe June 2nd, and we went public on June 12th, I think. Um, and that was the day that most students graduated from high school. So yeah. um, initially, I was concerned that we lost an opportunity to hold hands with our K-12 partners, and especially school counselors at the high school level, in getting the word out, since most students had already graduated by the time um, this was public. And yet, in that um, student survey that I mentioned, 50% of surveyed students said they heard about the gift through their high school. So our K-12 partners uh -huh. in the state went above and beyond in letting graduated students know about this opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it was really between June 12th and end of August that those 600 enrolled. Great. Other questions, comments? It, it's it's incredible. I, I hope, thank you. I. I uh, I hope you'll share the success nationally because I know we are not an anomaly here. Uh, and I know the federal government also is trying to give greater access, uh, particularly as it relates to community colleges. So um, I'm sure that uh, the Biden administration and other states would um, be really interested in learning about um, how successful this, this gift was. Thank you, um, Senator. I hope so too. I caught yesterday that Dr. Biden's um, uh, framed community colleges as our most powerful engine of prosperity. Um, I think in the context of COVID recovery, but I think it holds true. Um, I think it holds true generally, tr generally too. And as we think about um, the likely direction of federal funding, um, in the coming years and the likelihood that that funding will hinge on states, existing state support for um, affordable community college or other um, public college tuition, I think it's Ms. Weir, uh, you froze. I'll tell you. Even last night on the national news I was watching, you know, it's, no one is immune from it. Uh, so let's just give her a moment. If our conversation ever gets really tense or, con uh, or controversial, I'm going to pretend to freeze and just lock my. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, I think we found a little place that needs some uh, added uh, internet service. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, I think we may have lost her. Oh, here we She's in the waiting room. Here we are. Okay. <clears throat> There, Welcome she back. Is. there you are. I'm so sorry about that. That was oh, the end of my sentence. It, it, no problem at all. No, we were just saying no one is immune from those moments of uh, freezing. So uh, 
no problem. Uh, any other, anything else from you, Ms. Weir, or from anyone from the committee? We hope to have you back uh, as we make our way through, uh, you know, trying to uh, build on the incredible work that you all did and just congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. All right, have a good afternoon. You too, take care. Thanks. Great. So uh, committee, we are shifting gears uh, two directions uh, for the rest of the afternoon. We are returning to uh, S16. Uh, you may recall, we made a few edits to it. Uh, Mr. Demaray is here uh, to take us through those edits. Um, and then we are going to hear from Secretary French who will uh, respond to uh, the most recent draft. I'm still, and I'm looking to Senator Lyons. Uh, uh, Senator Lyons, have you been given the green light from Senator Ballant to take bill? We're gonna need to get some committee votes going and I'll, I'll loop to Senator Ballant. I'm just wondering if you have any insight um, into whether or not non-COVID bills can now make their way to the floor? You know, I can't answer that. The, okay. the bill, the, the one bill that we sent, we voted on today has- um, Money? No, no oh. money, but it does relate to um, stress and mental health issues. Yeah. Uh, and actually before, during and after COVID. So, but it's, um, it's, uh, Senator Terenzini will be justifying its existence when he presents it. Senator Terenzini, I am going to do you a big favor right now. Uh, in case, uh, you know, I think this has ended, but you, I'm sure, uh, oh, no, it, okay. Oh, of course, it, I tried to warn him about that. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> yes, you know, this, this uh, hazing, if you will, or not hazing, that's, you know, but these people, you know, people get up, I would just, uh, uh, be as prepared as possible. Um, but the good news is, yeah. I think I think we've sort of evolved out of it. Actually, I think it's I think it's good for us to evolve out of it. Um, and uh, but I'm sure you'll get one or two uh, hopefully humorous questions. Well, I appreciate that, Senator Campion. Uh, Senator Lyons did warn me of that uh, no less than two hours ago. But I uh, I. I did consider my options and one is just to uh, hit the leave the red leave button on my screen. So I could just leave the meeting. <laughs> oh, that's right. Freeze. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. So, well, I am not, you know, there are people, uh, in fact, everybody on this screen save for me is, is, is gifted when they get up and do these floor reports. I never have been. So uh, I'm not the one to look to for coaching, but I'll be there to defend you if, if you need any. I, I very much appreciate it. So yeah, it's a yeah. tough, tough crowd. It can be a tough crowd. Uh, all right. So can I, I, I will say that up, if, if you need a, a question to ask, I'm yes. happy to give you one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Right, right. And you could you could defer questions to the chair of your committee. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, true. yeah. that's true. That's true. Yeah. Although, but if it's coming from your chair, then I don't know. <laughs> right, exactly. No, he will probably say something like, well, you should know the answer to that. That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> I have a feeling it's going to be great. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, you know, the question to Senator Lyons, I will loop to Senator Ballant and just check in. It looks like I think we can, we can move this and vote on it probably later this week. Um, but uh, I'll confirm with her. So, Mr. Demaray, uh, thanks for being with us. And uh, please take us through the changes. Uh, and you are muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, do you want this on the screen or are you seeing this I on your screen? Unless other senators uh, want to see it on the screen, I'm fine with it not being on the screen. It's easier for me to see questions. Everyone has it? Okay, so yeah. I think we're okay without it. Thank you. Okay, so for the record, uh, Jim Damore going through draft 2.1 of your amendment to S16, which is uh, the creation of the School Discipline Advisory Council. Uh, Virtually changes from the draft you reviewed last week, just picking up a few comments. Um, so the first change is on page four. 
um, on lines 15 and 16. So it's just been clear that the membership of the task force has to be a balanced representation of the following. Jim, just so you know, it's technology. Uh, you're, you're in and out a little bit and it's uh, technology related. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, that, that's, that sounds good. Let me take up that camera. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Yeah? Perfect, perfect. Okay. Okay. Okay, so that's the first change. And then on the uh, page five, on uh, membership diversity, um, uh, again, uh, we made reference to balanced representation of public and approved independent schools, including therapeutic schools. And then the next change is on page seven, uh, top of the page. Uh, so one of the duties now, uh, number seven, is to review how other states address exclusionary discipline. And then the report requirements have changed a bit. Uh, we got more specific saying that the report has to address each of the um, task force duties under section D. Uh, and then it says the Agency of Education shall share the report and any related insights and best practices with Vermont educators, school, administ school administrators, policymakers, agencies, and education and advocacy organization to show post the report on its website. And the uh, incorrect references to subsections has been fixed. Um, and those are the only changes. One question I have, it's really for com the committee uh, on page four, we have um, high school students. Do we wanna just keep that? I mean, I'm assuming high school students. Is there any reason to just keep it students or is it just that we've, as I'm actually asking, it seems like it really would be high school students that we want. It's not as though somebody's going to have um, you know, I think a younger student. So, yeah, Senator Perslick. Um, yeah, it no, I, says it, doesn't it? It it says high school students. I was thinking uh, it should just say students, but then oh. as I was asking the question, right. I thought, well, it probably does make sense for it to be high school students. Senator Perslick, uh, I agree. So, I had another question separate from that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, on page five, where the change was balanced representation of public and independent schools and including therapeutic schools. I just wondered if, if we want balanced representation, does that mean there has to be equal number of independent schools and public schools or is it balanced in their proportional numbers? Cause it seems like you, that could be read that you have to have an equal number of public and approved independents. And I'm all supportive of approved independents being involved but I don't know if I want or if it's a good idea to have you know, one half of each. I think it's a very good point. So it's not clear in the draft. So your your dual interpretations could be, it's not clear. So we can clarify that point. What if we were to just get rid of balanced? How would you feel about that? Because then representation of public and approved independent schools, including therapeutic schools. I think Senator Perchlick makes a good point. I, I wouldn't want it 50-50. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, want it. I, I uh, how does how does that feel getting rid of balanced? Okay, and then it okay good. Why don't you get rid of that? Okay. Any other immediate concerns? Seeing that uh, we'll continue our work on this, and as is tradition, uh, a new senator will present it. So it's likely Senator Chittenden's and Senator Terenzini is already covered in health and welfare. We just. Uh, <laughs> uh, Anything, anything else at this point before we hear from Secretary French? Okay. Uh, Jim, if you don't mind staying on the line. Of course. Okay. Terrific, thank you. Mr. Secretary. Good afternoon. How are How you, are sir? You? Good to see you. Likewise, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, we appreciate you coming in. Uh, you've been part of this conversation already. Uh, as you know, we've, we've made some changes 
and um, would love to have you you weigh in and give us uh, uh, your advice, comments, um, you name it. Well, for the record, Dan French, Secretary of Education. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the work that's gone into this. Um, I think it's in really good shape. I did. There's just really one issue that stood out to me, um, which I, you know, is a point I raised previously, and it's uh, it has it emerges two places in the bill. Uh, the first time on page six in uh, what's number five. Yes. So the paragraph, um, analyze current data collection definitions practice used in Vermont for misconduct and for disciplinary actions that result in students exclusion and develop standard definitions and practices. So um, point I, I made previously, I think this is problematic uh, for Vermont to develop its own definitions. Um, you know, part of, certainly part of the rationale of the findings that are bringing this policy concern forward is this idea that we have national data and perhaps we don't have sufficient Vermont data. If we're gonna collect data from districts, and I, I think this is a worthy area to collect data, we need to ensure that it conforms with national data standards so that we can draw those valid comparisons to Vermont trends in other states. But just on a practical side, it becomes problematic for us uh, to implement if we're creating our own data defi definitions in Vermont when our data model that we've been trying to promulgate is in alignment with the uh, Common Education Data Store, the SEDS standard, the National Data Definition sort of dictionary, which I, in my view is, is broad and, and comprehensive. And I would just suggest that we not invent our own data definitions, but seek to use ones that are already available in the large lexicon of data definitions on the national level. Is there any, um... Anything problematic about that? In other words, uh, just thinking aloud, if is there a, is there a, a point, Mr. Secretary, where we would not agree with the definition in some way, uh, or it would just, you know, it it would really kind of pigeonhole us or put us back to kind of where we, you know, we're trying to evolve out of. Yeah, I think if, firstly, it becomes, you know, as I mentioned, I think it becomes problematic to draw a national comparison. So from a policy perspective, we're interested in, well, and how does, what is Vermont's context relative to nas the national or the other context from other states, which once again, as I read, is part of the rationale for promoting this is that we've, we've observed some national trends that are disturbing. Yeah. And we want to understand to what extent those trends exist in Vermont. And therefore, we want to collect some data to do that. To do that apples to apples comparison, we should be using the same data terms. Okay. And then secondly, and then this is where I sort of put on my secretary hat from a defending the capacity of the agency, it becomes really problematic for us to interject some new data definitions that are not in that broader sort of dictionary, if you will, of data elements. Um, it just, it, it becomes a multiplier of complexity as we seek to automate data collections from school districts um, you know, we're, we're going to be constantly saying, oh, this is a Vermont subset that doesn't necessarily exist in a larger model, as opposed to saying, here's the larger model, and then we can pick the elements from that that we want to see included in a specific Vermont collection. That makes it a lot easier for us to, uh, to manage over time. Senator Persley. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a point well taken, but I, and I wonder if just in, if we just, instead of using the word develop, we said adopt. We do have as necessary in there. So it's like you could say it's not necessary to develop, but instead just saying and adopt standard definitions and practices. Does that? Yeah, it could be. I mean, it's um, it does emerge two places in the bill. And I was going to point out it also is in um, the uh, on page eight. Um, <clears throat> so it does get to this in page eight at the bottom on line 13. Secretary of the State Board shall incorporate the task force standard definitions. Um, so in, in, to the Senator's point, uh, the task force adopted definitions or recommended definitions. Um, you know, and I would almost suggest something like the data elements as opposed to definitions. So <clears throat> the idea is not that the task force is going to define or create new standards of data, but they might select some from the dictionary that we're not collecting data on. Um, I think that would be more appropriate. Um, or just data, you know, Sean, corporate task force recommended data. 
you know, and then we could we could pull from the, the elements to do that. But it's problematic, I think, to, to engage in defining new data elements. How does that sound, Senator Perslick? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. And Jim, do you have enough information there to, to make that edit? Uh, I think I do, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Would we keep... Go ahead. Would we keep the word practices or Secretary French, are you also worried about practices? No, I think practices is a term of art. I mean, that's, that could include a wide range of activities. I'm not, that doesn't really have implications um, either on a comparative state by state basis, because, you know, for example, uh, restorative practices is, is, is not necessarily so narrowly defined from state to state that it would, would uh, cause a problem with drawing that comparison. And similarly, there's no standard. When we get into the practical aspect of collecting data, it's not, it's not going to be limiting or uh, impact our, our capacity. Okay. okay. Anything else, Mr. Secretary? No, I think I think that was really the one the one piece that stood out for me. I did um, I have read through the draft. Um, I think you know to your conversation about clarity, uh, just getting tighter on what you'd like me to do or the secretary to do relative to uh, balanced representation would be good to get some clarity on. But um, you know, the only the piece that stood out for me was that data definition part. Um, but I think that's really the only suggestion I had. Okay. Anything else, committee? I think we're going to loop back to make sure uh, touch base with our, our co-sponsors uh, of this and make sure they're comfortable and um, talk to a few caucus members and pro tem and and uh, perhaps have another conversation and then hopefully uh, move it forward. Mr. Secretary, while we while we have you here, I just wanted to give you. Uh, uh, a heads up, and we we have been, and I know you have been uh, looking at you know what we might be doing for students this summer uh, uh, around um, everything from mental health issues or uh, to just getting students out, sort of bringing them back into the academic fold. Some perhaps um, addressing some academic deficits, and we're hoping, if possible. Uh, we might have you back in Tuesday to talk with us a little bit about the agency's plan or thoughts and what we have, I will email you as well, um, to save you the time of watching uh, yesterday's testimony. Uh, just some of the, the things that we pulled out of having heard from, you know, for lack of a better expression, you know, the usual suspects, NEA. And, and I know this group has also been in conversation with you, but I didn't want to, um, uh, sort of catch you off guard in any way that, you know, we've been having these kinds of conversations as I think you're, you're aware of. Yeah, no, I mean, next week would be great. I think it's perfect timing from us. We've been, we have been working a lot with stakeholders to conceptualize this. I think I might've mentioned previously, it's been somewhat challenging um, at the national level to do this work because there's not many states ready for the conversation. Many yeah. states are still very much in, in thinking about, I would say some are even contemplating reopening their schools. You'll hear that a lot in the national media lately. Um, but um, we've been sort of pushing the conversation along. Uh, there's a number of states that have now joined in, maybe four or five states, but we're with our conditions in the state, I think we're ready to have that conversation. Not sure, you know, um, what the timelines would be, but the conceptualization of it is important. And part of the strategy is to do that planning now, yeah, specifically so we could leverage summer and, um, you know, not necessarily just wait till the fall to begin the conversation to really take advantage of the opportunity to have that conversation now. So we've 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 been pulling together the threads of the conversation and have reached a sort of, I think, a coherence uh, to it that we'd love to share with you next week. That'd be great. And leveraging the summer is, is a great way to put it. It's terrific. Uh, Senator Terenzini. Senator Campion, you can tell me it's not the right time to talk about it, but since we're in a 16, I, sure. I wanted to go back to a comment I made the other day, if you'd allow, and Senator Perchlick, I believe, responded to my question, but Maybe it's how I'm reading it or interpreter, interpreting it or thinking about the creation of this task force. But 
I'm still hung up on the part that says that um, in conjunction with the agency of education, make recommendations to end suspensions and expulsions for all but the most serious student behaviors. I sort of feel like, I don't know how to word it. We're, we're telling, if we're telling the committee what to, how to recommend it and what to, how to think already, then why have the committee and B, why don't, if, if there's folks on the committee that feel that we should get rid of um, expulsions and deten or uh, suspensions, then why don't we just enact that rather than including it in a task study where we're telling them how to think and how to proceed. Does that make sense? So uh, please correct me if I'm, I'm getting this wrong, but you're asking, you know, does it make sense just to pass a law that says, hey, you know, we've got enough research here, let's move away from this rather than create a task force that, um, you know, might may or may not get to, to basically where we want to be on these issues. Well, sure. it's sort of it's sort of like if I was asked to sit on the task force and, yeah. you know, you want um, my opinion because I'm bringing an expertise to the committee. And then I look at, oh, well, the, the Senate Ed Committee already decided for me that I need to be in support of uh, dissolving suspensions. I, I sort of don't think as a as a member of that committee that's going to be formed, you have the freedom of thought at that point. I see what you're saying. So that's what I keep getting hung up on. It's on page four and page five. It's both referred to. And, and so, and that, and maybe, maybe it, uh, I missed it the first time, but somehow I feel like that, that sort of made its way into this bill as it evolved. I don't remember it being in the original draft that we looked at. So uh, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I can take a look at the underlying bill unless Jim, you may already be ahead of me uh, looking to see if it was in the underlying bill. Uh, and Senator Perch, like I see your hand is up. It was not in the underlying bill. I do not think it was in the Senator Sears bill, but it was in the language that Secretary French provided. Right, good for, yeah. I'd be interested to hear what the secretary fe feels. Does he feel like it's settled that expulsions and suspensions out of school are, you know, or, you know, is that settled in, you know, the educational community that it's not helpful and that we need to move to how, how to implement it? Or does he think more discussion is needed on that question? Yeah, I, I, if I could, um, I, I, we didn't introduce the, the sort of the, um, I would say the findings that are in this final version that they're not unfamiliar to me. Uh, so I think, you know, to try to draw the connection to the other senator's comment, um, there is some, some national consensus that um, exclusionary, dis, dis, uh, exclusionary discipline processes uh, proportionally dis, uh, affect uh, students of minority populations and so forth. So it's, there's pretty strong data on that as part of a national trend. And um, so therefore uh, we should endeavor to examine to what extent that's happening in Vermont and endeavor also to see what we could do to minimize the use of such practices just based on what we already know of the national patterns. So that's, that's sort of the context I think for, for saying that. So in my, from my perspective, I think it's important to have um, broader engagement and conversation about uh, these topics and to what extent those patterns exist in Vermont and also, uh, from a practical standpoint, then examine to what extent uh, the more exclusionary practices could be limited. Um, so I think that's that's sort of the trend that we should examine. It, it comes from a national approach. It needs to be informed by Vermont data and uh, Vermont uh, perspective based on the practical uh, aspects of our diverse uh, education delivery system. So I think that's that's how I would draw the sort of thread the needle between the previous senator's comment and the, the rationale for the bill. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, uh, Commissioner French. I, I guess uh, I want to make it clear, if, if there's disproportionate suspensions or biases here, it, it absolutely needs to stop. It's, it can't be accepted. But I guess it's, a, it's another question for me is, then why don't we just come forward with something very simple and say, those in favor of ending suspension, let's just make it a, another bill. I mean, it just seems like this is a study that handles a lot of things. And now we're telling a committee how to think um, in one way uh, with the intentions of ending suspensions and expulsions. I'm, I'm probably splitting hairs here. I won't take any more of the committee's time, but it, it just seems like it, to me, it's a sort of a sticking point. So I'll move on though. Thank you, Senator. No, I, 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 I'm glad you're raising it. Um, 
I think, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like in a way, <clears throat> the goal of the commission, as sometimes we do with other commissions, we do give some general guide guidance uh, and direction uh, that, you know, we've looked at research, we've analyzed a number of things, and now we want to move in a particular direction. I, I'm just thinking of, you know, things we've done in natural resources, climate, uh, education, health and welfare, you know, here's the research. This is now the direction we're hoping to move in. That being said, I do feel like there's a piece of this that still recognizes that, you know, there are uh, certain behaviors, certain experiences uh, that a teacher might witness, be a part of, uh, that a student might exhibit that, that, you know, a suspension or expulsion might be necessary and how do we how do we work with that student going forward so um that's a little bit where i'm at i'm not sure if that's helpful senator terenzini well i pre i appreciate the comments I, I i and maybe it's just the way i'm interpreting it but i've served on panels and boards before mm -hmm. and i've just never been told sort of this is how i need to think as a board member or commi committee member of this and i just feel like we're you know you're going to pick 15 or 20 people to sit on here and um, hopefully you hopefully you think like us and you you know believe that we should get rid of suspensions for x amount of reasons so anyways like i said i i appreciate the time of the committee and i know that we have um senator hooker did you want to add something to this um uh, no actually i wanted to go back to summer and talk okay. about what you know what we may be doing and this morning um uh, secretary french the chair and i met with uh the money committee people and and the house ed people and talked about some of the things that would need to be done um to reach out to what yesterday people referred to as the ghost students who haven't shown up and my question was related to attendance and the um, how attendance has been kept during the pandemic and do you have data um, that shows you know where the where the kids are going to school and where they're not and would that be easily accessible so that that could inform the um, work that needs to be done for summer programs yeah, we don't, uh, if you were to ask me to produce a report for your use, I would not be able to do that very easily at this point. We do collect uh, essentially at the state level attendance data on an annual basis. We have implemented a monthly data collection, uh, which I'd be happy to share the results with you on, on a general level. Once a month, we ask school districts to indicate the number of their students that are either in in-person, hybrid, or remote. But on the other hand, the school districts have their, their granular data necessary for the planning for their specific circumstances, so they have a good sense of, of the need. Um, and just you know, to foreshadow a bit uh, for next week, if we come in and testify on this, because I would also like to include our, our deputy secretary who's been leading uh, a lot of this up, uh, Heather Boucher. The, um, it's important that I think what in broad sense, what we're thinking to do is to, to point districts towards sort of a triage disposition in the spring to, to sort of listen and find out what, what are the issues in their districts. And that's, we, we have in a very directive way, how to, an idea of how to do that. And then secondly, to create plans and then to move to implementation uh, this spring, uh, which would include the use of summer programming. Um, as opposed again to waiting to the fall. But we also know there's, you know, there's going to be a need uh, to transition to the summer. And part of that in schools is a celebratory disposition. So the people are gonna be interested in saying, oh, we've gotten through the winter, you know, and let's land, end the school year on a positive note. Um, we also know that our systems have been operating nonstop, especially issues like food service programs have been oper operating nonstop since last March. So there's gonna be need to be some downtime in the summer as well. But the point I'd make is that we have an opportunity to do the planning, which would lead to some prioritization, and then districts uh, using their data to develop specific district level plans of how to intervene. Uh, because we're not gonna find, I'm pretty sure that all students have been affected the same in all, all districts. So districts are gonna have to come up with specific approaches. There are gonna be some general trends uh, that are gonna require some state uh, response and, and truancy in our attendance is one of them. And specifically we've already had, you'll see in our planning, it's one of the domains. We're going to have to come up with a more, um, uh, I'll say broad approach to that issue. We, we qualify it as engagement issues with students. You use the term ghost students, but our current truancy uh, 
levers, if you will, are, are going to be woefully inadequate to address that issue. And really, you can see truancy in a pandemic as sort of being tip of the iceberg of a lot of other issues that are going on with students and their families. So we're going to we're going to have to organize uh, state government services as well between DCF mental health and the Agency of Education. Um, and we're going to I think that'll be a common theme in every region, but we're going to have to um, figure that out. We currently truancy is organized on a regional basis through the state's attorneys in each region. But we're going to have different patterns in each region. So at any rate, that's sort of the broad brush what we're looking at. I think I, I would I think summer is important, but it's sort of um, a conclusion from an analysis that needs to occur first. And we'll get districts there, but we want them to go into that planning well informed about what their priorities are. The other key thing is that this spring, sometime around in April, is when they start formulating their grant strategies for the consolidated federal program grants. These are like the title grants, title one, title two, which are traditionally the major funding systems that support summer school. So um, they're gonna have to come up with their plans for those grant funds in additional to their ESSER grant funds and so forth that have been provided as a result of the COVID emergency. So it's important that districts engage in some planning process and set priorities that can inform and focus, help to focus their resources and leverage summer uh, to its maximum potential. Thank you. Great, and we'll continue this conversation next week. Uh, we are going to now shift after, a, we're gonna take a little break, but we're gonna shift to uh, a bill that Senator Hardy has introduced on libraries. Um, we are going to start to put together a miscellaneous education bill, um, which will cover a number of different topics. And so when we return, uh, at about five minutes to three, we will do that. The one final thing I want to say, uh, Senator Terenzini, if, if as you look at this bill, uh, and I would say this to, to any senator, um, you know, we are going to look at it again. We're going, we have more witnesses coming in to weigh in on it. One approach would be if there is language that you would like to see in it, um, you know, ledge council could always draft that and you could propose it even in this committee to all of us to, to, to just sort of hammer out, have a discussion. You might not even want to have a have an official vote on it, but it, it could be, it's always a good way to just bring something to the table. I know I've done that uh, in natural resources and finance over the years, sometimes asking people to, to amend language, other times just bringing it in as a, as a way to have a discussion. So um, there's that process also. We are now shifting uh, topics. Uh, we are going to look at libraries in the state of Vermont, and I apologize, uh, as we are, uh, I thought we had <clears throat> already had our, the bill sponsor and a walkthrough on this, uh, and thankfully, Ms. Lowell, our uh, great committee assistant, indicated that we had not. So we are starting to think about building a, a, um, a miscellaneous education bill. Um, this might be one of the things we put in it, or we might have it go as a standalone. Uh, and with that, I want to welcome, I believe, Senator Hardy, the bill sponsor, is here. And uh, Mr. Anderson, good to see you as well, uh, Ledge Council. And so we're going to have uh, Senator Hardy uh, give us uh, an understanding of why she put this bill in, uh, and then we'll move to Mr. Anderson for an overview. And then we have a, a number of different witnesses. And, and for those of you who uh, may have tracked this committee's work last year, I believe Senator Perchlick is our uh, committee historian. It passed out of this committee and uh, unfortunately because of COVID um, didn't make it uh, anywhere else along the way. So with that, Senator Hardy, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for having me here to the Education Committee. Um, just one note, the bill passed out of the Education Committee and passed the full Senate as well and moved over to the House, but then got caught up in the COVID crisis. Um, so thanks for having me. I love libraries and Senator Perchula can remember my um, enthusiasm about libraries. And so um, as uh, soon as I was on the education committee and got my bearings, I immediately started thinking about doing a bill on libraries. And then our wonderful state librarian, Mr. Jason Broughton came to committee and I started working with him on putting together this bill um, along with um, 
the chair of the library board, um, Bruce Post, who I also see on the screen, um, as well as a lot of local librarians around the state talking about how we could um, do a full sort of analysis and assessment of the status of libraries in Vermont, um, how they provide services, um, who they serve, what kinds of resources they have in terms of books and technology and um, other items that may be in the library and how they participate in and add to our communities around the state. Nearly every little town or most little towns have a library, um, as well as our big cities and, and bigger towns, um, big cities and bigger towns. Um, so it's a real statewide resource. Um, and also um, our colleges and our universities and our schools, most of those have libraries as well. So this bill would take a comprehensive look at libraries throughout the state. Um, and it would create um, a working group that would um, make a report on the status of libraries in Vermont. Um, the working group would be chaired by the state librarian and include um, members um, uh, from the library association, the executive director of the Vermont Humanities Council, which also has some um, work related to libraries, representatives of public libraries from different kinds of public libraries, school libraries from different Senator, sizes. Senator Hardy, Senator, I don't, I, uh, sorry to interrupt. Sure. Anything you could just, I mean, Ledge Council will bring us through. Oh, okay. We want right. them to we'll give us the, the big dig, but. You know, why you put this, are you afraid libraries are closing? Are you hoping libraries will close? Are you, you know, what sorts of things got you to put this bill in? That's what we would okay. like. Okay, got it. And Tucker will take care of the details. All right. So the, the reason I put together this bill is so that we could have a comprehensive assessment of where right. we are with libraries. I don't want libraries to close. I think they're an incredibly valuable resource to our communities and they need more support and they need more connections with each other in order to um, really be able to provide the types of services in the 21st century that our towns need. Um, so this bill passed last year. The two, there are a couple differences in this bill compared to the last year. And I'm just gonna highlight those because as with everything, um, libraries have been impacted by COVID. And so um, this does include some provisions um, to address how libraries have been impacted by COVID. Um, as many of you know, they have been a huge source of providing access to the internet and access to technology and to information for our communities. And so it's really important that they um, be able to talk about how they've been impacted. Um, it also would change some dates um, about reporting data um, to make sure that the that the data isn't skewed by the fact that most people aren't actually physically going to libraries right now um, during COVID. So um, Mr. Broughton can explain that and it would push out the, um, the, the time for the report. There are some sec sections at the end of the bill that don't have to do with the actual library um, study. And those were, um, I put in there at the request actually of some house members and the administration. This was part of a miscellaneous library bill that was passed by the house last year. Um, Mr. Broughton can certainly speak to this, but I believe those provisions are no longer necessary. Um, and so I think that starts in section two and Tucker can take you through that. Um, so just a heads up that those provisions in the bill are probably not needed anymore. Um, but um, I would really love for this bill to pass. I would, I would request for whatever it's worth that it go ahead as a standalone bill, um, mainly because there have been challenges with getting miscellaneous education bills passed over the last several years. And I would hate to see this get held up. Um, I think this bill has broad support. I, I don't know anybody who doesn't love libraries. Um, it's a definitely a nonpartisan, everybody cheers for this kind of thing. So I'd really love to make sure it goes forward. So um, thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Senator Hardy? We of course can't promise its path. Uh, this committee, I have a feeling is gonna have a lot of luck with miscellaneous education bills. Um, <laughs> and um, so I, uh, any, any immediate questions or any pressing questions for Senator Hardy? Okay, thank you for coming down. Appreciate it. Mr. Anderson, how are you? 
I am fantastic, Mr. Sure. Chair. Sure. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Tucker Anderson with the Office of Legislative Counsel. Great. Shall uh, I dive right into the overview? That, that would be terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will start with uh, section one under the first reader assistance heading dealing with the establishment and duties of the working group on the status of libraries in Vermont. Subsection A creates the working group and then has a brief statement of intent around the creation of the working group. Uh, so within this proposed session law, it states that the intent is to strengthen and support libraries of all sizes and improve library services for the public. Subsection B deals with the membership of this particular working group. And there are 11 members. Uh, Senator Hardy had started diving into the membership uh, specifically, but the members are the state librarian, the president of the Vermont Library Association, the executive director of the Vermont Humanities Council, three representatives of public libraries who are from libraries of different sizes and throughout the state, two representatives of public school libraries, again, from libraries of different sizes and throughout the state, two representatives of college and university libraries, one public library trustee, be appointed by the president of the Friends and Trustees section of the Vermont Library Association. That comprises the entire working group. Um, moving on to subsection C, we'll take a look at the powers and duties of the working group. What I will do for you is give you a high level overview. This is a very comprehensive section. The language gets into a great deal of detail around the duties of the group, um, but there are shalls and mays. So I will focus on what is mandatory and what is optional and allow you to ask questions if there's anything specific within this comprehensive language that you need. Right. Uh, so first, the shalls. Uh, the working group shall study library services for specific segments of the Vermont population. That's in subdivision C1. In C2, they shall study the role that libraries play in emergency preparedness, cultural diversity and inclusion, public health and safety, community identity and resiliency, economic development, and access to public programs and services. Subdivision three is new. Uh, the group shall study the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on library operations and services. And then four, the mandatory piece here in four is a general study, of the overall status of libraries, including information related to programming, collections, facilities, technology, and staffing. The subdivisions that follow that, which are A through E, get into more granular detail about what may be studied under each of those categories, programming, collections, facilities, technology, and staffing. Um, I'll touch upon a few of them. If you want greater detail, happy to go into any of it. Under the category of programming, uh, the working group may study things such as attendance at the library programs, whether programs are meeting community needs, uh, they, there may be an assessment of public engagement and outreach surrounding programs. Under the category of collections, they may study the size and diversity of library collections, including any historical materials. Moving on to page four, the category of facilities. They may study whether the library facilities and buildings could be improved with regard to, for example, energy efficiency, accessibility, flexibility, meaning the ability to move around components of those facilities. Technology, subdivision D. They can study whether the Vermont libraries have sufficient access to technological resources, cybersecurity, et cetera. Under staff, subdivision E, the group uh, may study staffing levels at Vermont libraries and whether staffing is sufficient to meet community needs. I move on to subsection D, which deals with uh, mandatory and discretionary solicitation of public input. So first, the shall. The working group shall solicit feedback from the general public and the library users around the state. The discretionary authority. 
the working group may examine models for library management and organization in other states, including the formation of statewide service networks. This is something that uh, the committee last biennium took a look at and decided should be a discretionary study if there is time. Subsection E starting on page five, line one is new. And this is the piece that Senator Hardy mentioned around uh, data collected related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so it states that the data used in any of these analyses may be from prior to the pandemic. Again, recognizing that there may have been a shift in the demand on libraries because of the COVID-19 response. Additionally, they may also use data from the post-pandemic era. This is all discretionary. There's no mandate around the data that has to be used. It does recognize that data can be used for different purposes, different temporal ranges, depending on what they're studying, such as use of physical space within the libraries. Subsection F gives the group discretionary authority to solicit feedback from the Board of Libraries. Subsection G allows the working group, well, states that the working group shall have administrative, technical, and legal assistance from the Department of Libraries. Under subsection H, we get into the reporting duties of the working group. Uh, the deadline for the final report is on or before November 1st, 2023. Uh, the group shall submit a report to the education committees in the House and Senate, and it shall contain specific and detailed findings and proposals concerning the issues set forth in subsection C. So this relates back to all of those mandatory pieces that we talked about before we got into the more granular details. Further, uh, they shall submit recommendations for updating the statutes, rules, standards, and governance structures of Vermont libraries to ensure equitable access for Vermont residents, efficient use of resources, and quality in the provision of services. Recommendations uh, shall also be submitted related to the funding needs of Vermont libraries. They may also submit any other information or recommendations that they deem necessary as part of their report and recommendation to the General Assembly. Subsection I deals with uh, meetings and in some sense procedures around the meetings of the working group. Uh, first, the state librarian shall be the chair of the working group. Uh, for some of the working groups and task forces that you may have seen in the past, this is often uh, an elected position by the body, by the committee itself. Here it is stated that the state librarian shall be the chair and that the chair, chair shall call the first meeting of the group to occur within 45 days after the effective date of the act. Um, a quorum of this working group is a majority of the membership. And finally, the working group shall cease to exist on December 1st, 2023. That's one month after the date that the report is due. Under subsection J, we get into the compensation and reimbursement of the members. Members of the working group are entitled to per diem compensation and reimbursement under 32 VSA section 1010. Uh, that is the section that details how compensation and reimbursement are applied to all of the boards and committees um, of the state. Uh, they may be compensated for not more than 12 meetings. Uh, the payments shall be made from monies appropriated to the Department of Libraries, and that appropriation is made in subsection K. Uh, the sum of $4,000 is appropriated to the department from the general fund in fiscal year 2022 for compensation reimbursement. Uh, Senator Hardy briefly mentioned this uh, we've hit the next reader assistance heading, which deals with technical corrections concerning the Department of Libraries. Uh, this morning, House Government Operations went through a committee bill, uh, walked through that. It was just a very exciting morning for everyone to hear my monotone for so long. Um, and many of the sections and repeals that you're dealing with here are included in that committee bill. However, that committee bill is more comprehensive in the cleanup it does. It includes a 
much more repeal of outdated and inapplicable statutes. Um, and you may want to either decide to take this section out or harmonize it with the work that House Government Operations is doing so that we don't inadvertently put back in statutes that um, have been otherwise changed or repealed in their bill. Would you like a walkthrough of this piece of the bill? Sure, why don't you give us a, a quick overview of it? Uh, section two repeals uh, a subsection and interesting statute that deals with the specific locations of certain offices within the state. And the subsection that's being repealed states that the principal office of the uh, Division for Historic Preservation and the Board of Libraries shall be in Montpelier. And it is my understanding that that is not the case and has not been the case for a little while. Um, section three. Uh, Another interesting section. Under current law in this um, section, any copy of a statute, law, or decision of another state that is kept in the state library can be used as prima facie evidence uh, in court. And the proposal here in section three is to eliminate the reference uh, uh, to the state library in Montpelier. That's a technical correction. Uh, the House has taken a closer look at this, House GovOps, and decided that that clause should likely be stricken in its entirety. Section four uh, allows the, um, the Secretary of Education, when arranging conferences um, and summer schools for superintendents and teachers, to uh, cooperate with the Board of Libraries and the addition here or the state librarian in that preparation. Sections um, five and six deal with a little bit of cleanup around uh, the uh, printing distribution and maintenance of certain documents and records. Um, and this, these are two pieces of a larger cleanup that is happening. First in section five, uh, references to state documents and documents relating to other states and local governments um, is eliminated from a section that requires uh, that the Department of Libraries provide, administer, and maintain those collections and store them in other repositories, depositories throughout the state. Section six uh, deals with uh, bids relating to printing services that are uh, arranged by buildings and general services. And um, I'm sure that some of the folks that are in the room with you now, the virtual room with you now can provide more context, but it is my understanding that these services are no longer provided by BGS. So this is a cleanup eliminating um, statutory references to processes around printing that no longer exist. There are a few repeals at the end, again, dealing with statutes that relate to printing and distribution requirements um, that are no longer in practice. And that Correct. is all. Yeah, so, uh, so did this, I'm just curious, um, some of these repeals and, and general cleanup, this came from the committee's work last year as they were taking testimony, is that accurate or? Or was this, this was included in last year's bill that Pat, or um, the very first version? The particular provisions that you have in front of you came yeah. from a bill that passed the House, but was not taken up in the Senate. Okay. Um, and then the working group pieces came out of this committee last year. Okay. Uh, Committee, I'm wondering to what everybody's, I guess I could, am I using it correctly? I'm looking to know what everybody's prima facie is of the bill. First impression, it's a library joke. I, I've been working on it since I Googled it. Pretty good, Mr. Anderson? 
I, I do appreciate it. I have tried to stop uh, laughing at puns so that there's no recordings of my uh, unprofessional <laughs> honorary. Uh, committee, uh, Senator Perchlick. Uh, yeah, I mean, because we passed it out last year. I don't have any problem with the first sec. The second section, we didn't deal with last year. Right. As Mr. Anderson just said, it came from the House. But I do have, just to refresh my memory and, and maybe of others, uh, maybe Mr. Anderson can tell us who the Board of Libraries is. Ooh. I think that you actually have a representative from the Board of Libraries in the room who may be able to very eloquently describe what the Board of Libraries is and their uh, remaining duties under statute. Here I am. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bru for the record, uh, I'm Bruce Post. Uh, I'm from Essex and I am chair of the State Board of Libraries. Uh, which has been in existence for a while, first of all, under many different kinds of uh, personalities. Uh, at one time, the, ch the, Supreme the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was the chair of the Board of Libraries because it had so much authority over the state law library in Montpelier. Times have changed. At present, the Board of Libraries has two functions. First, it advises the state librarian. Uh, advises. We can't tell him or her what to do, but we provide advice. And in my tenure on the board, we've had some pretty good interactions uh, and have provided some decent advice, I believe. The second uh, responsibility we have uh, is we are the, uh, essentially for Vermont, the Board of Geographic Naming. And we name geographic features. Um, we used to also name transportation features. Uh, Thankfully, that was uh, shifted to the uh, Board of Transportation. I'm glad we don't deal with it. At one point, the board dealt with naming a, a, a rotary somewhere. Um, but uh, so Mr. that's- Mr. Post, let me just interrupt you for a second. So uh, you're still responsible for naming geographic features in the state? Yes. So if, for example, I wanted something named for Senator Terenzini, I would go to you and say, and make my case a geographic feature is she deceased oh. she would need to be deceased yeah. i just yeah. have to jump in she must be deceased this or is he. a state librarian or he she must. yes okay. he in this case five years uh we have a rule right. that that we wait five years uh after someone has been deceased and i think the reason for that is that uh we allow the period of uh of uh fond appreciation to cool a little bit so that there's not uh, a rush to name something. So uh, that's that's the policy we do. And I think that tracks with the federal um, federal statute, the federal practice as well through the US Geological Survey. Okay, thank you for that. I didn't know that that's very helpful. Um, so uh, let's see, uh, Senator uh, Lyons, um, I, you want to jump in and, and then we'll move to uh, hear testimony. Go ahead. I just have a, I have a, I have a question about section three. <clears throat> um, section three, two, or no, it's section five, sorry. Number two on page eight. So I, mean, I just a, a question of interest and what is the relationship then between the collection and the storage of documents? Uh, what's the relationship with the state archivist and the state archives? Is this under the jurisdiction of the state libraries? How does it intersect with what Tanya Marshall does? Given that we're looking, I'm looking here at federal and state documents, or is this just uh, an additional something that the libraries can do? Mr. Anderson. So I uh, would again defer to an expert in the room uh, who raised their hand. I think it's from the Department of Libraries. Um, but it is my understanding that this section deals with uh, direct reflection of federal law, uh, past federal law relating to libraries that act as federal depositories. And that is as far as my historical knowledge about this section goes. 
If the chair would be so kind, I'd like to, uh, as your state librarian, have Please. the expert, Tom McMurdo, who oversees this area of our capacity, discuss this briefly. Um, we are in concert with archives, but it will be explained shortly on how that works. Great. Mr. McMurdo, please. Yes. Um, so briefly, we are a federal depository library. We're part of the uh, Federal Depository Library Program, which is the federal government's way of dis disseminating um, government documents. We are one of the oldest federal depository libraries in the country, dating back, I believe, to 1848. So we've been doing this for a long time. Um, I believe the, the relating to the question is essentially what happens to these documents. Um, we keep federal documents. The uh, archives under their statutes that were created, in, I believe in 2008, 9, and 10, uh, Tucker, you can correct me if I'm wrong there, but I believe that those statutes um, direct state documents to be stored at uh, archives. So as far as um, those materials are concerned, state documents are in the vault at archives we do retain a historical um, law collection at the Department of Libraries. We have a pretty comprehensive um, legislative history collection. So these materials are stored and are kept. So it's not, not a question of losing anything. It's just a matter, I think, to your point, uh, Senator Lyons, of where these materials are, who's looking after them, and, and what uh, their disposition is. Does that answer the question? Great. Great. Thank you. Other questions on the contents as walked through by Mr. Tucker before we uh, begin taking uh, testimony. Okay, very good. Seeing none, uh, we will start. Is it, uh, Jason, do I pronounce your last name Broughton? It can be. <laughs> What is the proper pronunciation? Broughton. Broughton. All right, Mr. Broughton, uh, glad you're with us today. Uh, I know you you played a role likely last year in uh, the construction of this bill and uh, glad you're here to weigh in. So with that, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for having me. Um, one of the more important parts about this bill for us as a department is we would like to take a baseline of our libraries and how we interact with them because I've had a lot of senators and representatives statewide ask me, well, how is our library doing? And in some capacity, we can tell you that, but we cannot, uh, for the record, tell you what is a baseline level of service for public libraries in the state of Vermont. Each of them are all different. So this will create a gauge to say what is applicable, what's affordable, what is not, where we are seeing gaps, and also at the same time, because there's a lot of conversation, for example, around technology and broadband, we are also waiting in anticipation of what the state and the federal government will do on that topic because that also impacts a lot of libraries across the state. For example, um, over the summer, we worked with the Department of Public Safety and we helped a lot of libraries to turn on their Wi-Fi for 24 hours a day you have hopefully heard that a lot of people in your community are using the library at all times of day, sitting in their cars now to access services. And it took a lot of methodical work, but it was something that the libraries wanted to do. But in some cases, not all libraries, believe it or not, have good Wi-Fi. And for those that do, sometimes it's not as reliable. So we would like to know that and just make it available. Down the line, this report would serve as a wonderful way for us to review where Vermont libraries are at, public libraries per se, and interactions with school libraries and academia, and use that to begin to examine the statutes. One of the things that I know that we celebrate in Vermont is that we are uniquely, I would say, um, up to date on things. Well, when it comes to our library standards and statutes, some of them are 40 years old and outmoded and outdated. So we aren't even able to collect data because on record, some of those actually need to be updated. So this study is a nice way for us to not have to guess it's going to give us a flashlight in the dark right now because the Department of Library does not oversee any library in the state. What we do 
assist, administer, consult, collaborate, and sometimes cajole if I'm upfront into how can we work together to do a variety of things. Um, at the current moment, I would say they appear to um, appreciate me. I wouldn't say like, but they do listen to me. And so right now we have a sentiment that yes, this is something that we want to do just to see how services across Vermont are doing. With that, um, the State Board of Library Chair, Bruce Post, could also add from his perspective, because he was here before I, not saying that he's older, but he also has some interesting information that he can relay about the importance of a bill such as this through his experience as a board chair. Uh, terrific, that's very helpful. Um, any questions, uh, committee, before we move on to, uh, I think it makes sense perhaps that we will switch around a little bit. Senator Hooker. Just a quick one, Mr. Broughton. Uh, how many libraries are there in the state and do libraries have to register with the state? No, they do not have to. Well, let me back up. It depends on the type of library. There are some libraries that have to register with the Secretary of State because they're a 501c3. Mm -hmm. Herein lies the wonderful part of Vermont where we have different types of libraries, free, public, nonprofit, um, definitely a whole range. And they each have different parameters of how they have to operate if they have a specific type of board or what the state requirements are. We have been keeping records since our inception of the libraries, but they don't necessarily have to register with us. But because of the way we distribute our funding, state and federal, it makes it very helpful if they do. So in a sense, we kind of capture it. But we have, um, at last count, and Tom, you can correct me, I think 186 libraries were down from 196. And are the, these the libraries that are, quote, registered with the state? And would this bill only apply to those libraries? No, it would apply to all the public libraries. We are asking to understand where the libraries are at, what types we have, um, who has gone away since inception, who's remaining, and how are they doing? I know the smallest one in Danville is there. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Tom, would you like to add something really quick? Because uh, he also works with our state library data coordinator. So he also sure. knows some of the stats really quickly on our libraries. Yes, if I may just briefly Please. add a comment. Absolutely. Great. Um, yes, uh, right now there's 185 public libraries, maybe 186. There's, there's a library possibly being formed in Marlboro. Yes. Um, uh, according to statute, to be a public library, uh, you, sh you have to get at least $1 of tax money from your town. So it's a little bit flexible. You can have uh, essentially a private library that gets a dollar from the town. So, um, but uh, you, if you're a public library, you have to offer services to the public. Um, so we do feel, yeah, there's approximately 185 public libraries in the state. Uh, with all libraries, uh, there, we were just discussing this number earlier, I believe there's uh, just over 320 school libraries and mm -hmm. 18 academics, I think. So, uh, But this bill applies only to those 185, roughly, public libraries. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Um, I just have one uh, before we move on to Mr. Post, and that is... What's the most unusual library that we have in Vermont? Do we have a library that is kind of unique or um, or are, are they all kind of a little bit, not cookie cutter, but you know, their, their collection is not. Um, mm, I don't know. Yes, I can give you, it depends. Um, and I mean that in a good way or unique. No, 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 yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, Here's what I can give you. It will depend on the lens you're viewing it. And to me, the most unique library that you probably have in Vermont, um, a lot of people would say, yes, it's in this number, would be the St. Johnsbury Antonym. Uh -huh. um, it's probably the most unique. But your, if you look through another lens, your most furthest library out in the state from everybody else is Canaan. And they came online with our services. So right. way up there near Canada even. And I visited those wonderful people. They actually invited me sadly last year to come to the North Country Moose Festival and I was not able to go because of COVID. So I look forward to going in 2022 to the North Country Moose Festival. Um, you also have physical libraries that are kind of distinct. You also have Carnegie libraries in the state. You have the oldest one, the Thetford Library in the Federation. So there is, it all depends on the lens that you wanna see, including um, the smallest libraries, the largest libraries. Mm -hmm. 
But I would say the St. John's for Anthony is the most unique because it's, it's a museum, an art gallery, a library, a collection study. But then yeah. again, let me talk about libraries is not what you want to hear all day because I just love to talk about the things in libraries. No, it's well, a deadly glad, thing. No, we're glad you do. That's why we have you in that position. Uh, Mr. Post, uh, your impressions of the bill, please. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank Senator Hardy for uh, being so visionary about this. Uh, when I joined the board in 2011, uh, we would get an annual report from the state librarian full of statistics of various kinds. Uh, and it reminds me of the line of the ancient mariner, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. Uh, we had all sorts of numbers, but never could tell a real story. And I think this bill comes along at, at a wonderful time because we will take a comprehensive, it will, the committee will take a comprehensive look at Vermont libraries, uh, capacities. Staffing, you know, is very important. You know, um, someone with a master of library science, I think is a rare creature here in Vermont. Um, uh, many of the libraries can't afford them or they can't keep them. Uh, what is the state of volunteers? So I, I believe that if you're gonna make decisions, uh, you should have up-to-date information. And I agree with Jason, um, the library standards have to be um, uh, overhauled. They're long, it's long overdue. But also when we talk about standards, uh, we don't force libraries necessarily to do things. But remember, this is a, a grassroots library state. Different states have different arrangements. Uh, Ohio, I think, has a county system. The same thing may happen in uh, Colorado and, and things like that. So we want to recognize this, uh, this local control, local talent, local affection uh, aspect of our libraries and, and, uh, and a, a, you know, accumulate that knowledge so folks can make decisions. That includes the legislature. That might include select boards. Uh, it might include other state agencies. So obviously I support it. Uh, I just have one year left on my uh, career on the State Library Board, and, and I, I hope to see this thing start before I leave. Thank you. Terrific. Well, we will certainly uh, aim toward that as well. Uh, committee, questions for uh, Mr. Post? Okay. Uh, yes, please, Mr. Ter Senator Terenzini. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I was going to add just... Um, I would echo what Senator Hardy said earlier, who doesn't love a library? Uh, and if you like a good old fashioned library controversy, uh, Senator Hooker and I would love to invite you to Rutland right now to see um, the division between two parties on whether our library should relocate or not. So that's, uh, wow. that's from page news often. So stay tuned. <laughs> Yes, Senator. I, I would just like to add to that because this building that our library is housed in was built in 1835 or whatever. And I have to say, uh, Mr. Broughton, that it may be one of the more unique ones since we have a cell in the basement of the building. It used to be a courthouse and there's a holding cell there and booksellers, uh, the book sale sellers of which I am a part, we call ourselves the seller sellers. And we have a sort of shadow library down there with stacks and um, books categorized and it's just a wonderful place. So I don't know how I feel about the idea of moving this library. <laughs> I do would like, I would like to ask a question of the chair. So please, Cruz, um, when you have people who have overdue fines that you put them in the cell <laughs> underneath the library? <laughs> we haven't lately. But I bet it happened in the past. <laughs> I like it. Terrific. Uh, next up, uh, let's go back uh, to the top here. Uh, Janet uh, Schaefer. Jeanette Schaefer. Yes, Jeanette Schaefer, Assistant yes, State Librarian for Library Advancement. Thank you. Thank you. So please tell me your impression, or please tell us your impressions of the bill and uh, any comments you might have. Yeah, I, I concur with, uh, with our state librarian. Uh, we, we don't really have a baseline of information of libraries because everybody's independent. Everybody gets to um, really run their libraries as they deem 
appropriate, of course, along with their boards and municipalities, if, if that if they are a municipal library. And we in order to even um, figure out how we can best serve them, this bill would would be appropriate. And I also concur with um, with Senator Hardy, who thought it was important to help libraries figure out how to connect with each other and to connect and collaborate also with their service needs. So a lot of them, because they're doing everything on, on their own and independently, they don't have a lot of purchasing power. They don't have a lot of the professional services that entities need, such as uh, legal help, human resources support, and uh, those kinds of supports that an organization needs. And if we knew how we could best serve them um, by having a good assessment of the landscape, then we could help them also connect to each other and figure out how to help them collaborate with each other on, uh, provide, on getting services like professional services. So I, I am in favor of this and would welcome a passing. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions uh, for Ms. Schaefer? Uh, please, Senator Lyons. I'm not sure it's only for Ms. Schaefer, but um, as you were, as I'm looking at the list of folks who are testifying and you began your testimony, um, we're talking about a department of libraries and I'll plead my ignorance. Are you located where? or where are you located in state government? Are you a separate entity? Are you in an agency, the agency of administration? Um, that would just maybe a bit about how the organization itself, how you're organized. If the chair so approves, I'd like to answer that as a state librarian. Uh, sure, absolutely. All right, with Central Lions, um, we were in Montpelier for over a hundred something years, right next to the Supreme Court building. We reside under the agency of administration. Mm -hmm. um, and some people might say, well, you're a very small department. How did that come to be? But one must also remember the beginning of the library system with the department meant at a certain point, people saw it as the Department of Libraries kind of oversaw all of the independent libraries in the past. And that provided us, I guess, that um, connection that we agreed to come into in 1968 under the AIDS administration. At that time, though, we had regional hubs, we had over 100 employees, and you had over 196 libraries. So we were considered a very big powerhouse as a department. Now, the regionals are gone. Our last ended about three years ago. We have moved out of Montpelier and we now reside in Barry uh, with the Vermont Historical Society. We have renovated the remaining half of the old Spalding High School to which the governor attended. Um, he did let me know that he was in the principal's office quite a lot, he said. I was kind of shocked that he showed us where that was and used to be. Um, but along with that, we have a really happy relationship with where we are at in the new building. We still, however, even though the physical presence of what I would call the hub and spoke, um, where we would be central and the regionals were out in their own buildings, the buildings are gone, but we still do things by county and by region by way of consultants. So we still have outreach across the land to all of our libraries in different capacities. Uh, you know, as you're, as you're speaking it, and I'm thinking about this structure that you've been talking about, um, it, it really, it seems to me that libraries are really uh, not only protective of our history and understanding our history, but also of the First Amendment and how important the work that you do in protecting our uh, communications and written word, written now, recorded and everything else word, but um, is there anything in your... Um, your mission, the charge, the state, uh, the statutory uh, vision for libraries that speaks to your word, your role in protecting First Amendment rights. I would say yes to this. One of our cornerstones that might not be in 
uh, the mission. I'm going to pull that up um, in just a second, if I can, but just go navigate through it. We as a library, no matter what type we are, we have a few things that we have, as I call, of being in the club. One of our biggest things is going to be intellectual freedom. So all libraries believe in that. Uh, freedom to read, um, that's going to be unique. Of course, if we had someone come in and say, could you please help me find the anarchist dictionary? We're not going to really ask, but we might say, hmm, that's interesting <laughs> um, <laughs> within that. But we also work to make sure that we are considered a safe space. But when we say that, we need to understand also that safe spaces do not mean disagreement will not occur. It means it's a safe place to have civil and sometimes uncivil discourse. You are allowed, in a sense, to have that discussion. So you will find a lot of people usually when they want to create a conversation with the community, they will almost have it. And it's wonderful in New England that you have this too. Town halls, if they have them, and if they're full or booked, they immediately go to the library because they know you can have an argument um, amongst people and people will be able to walk away and say, well, I understand, as opposed to a fight. So we do have it our, as our mission as a library, no matter what, to make sure that we are democratizing people to much more access and information as possible as we can. Thank you. Terrific testimony, thank you. Uh, Senator Chinton. So uh, future speakers might be touching upon this and maybe Dean Geffert, but I know at the university level, we have uh, shared resources. So interlibrary loans are quite common. I'm curious, is there a lot of interloan libraries of collections between the Vermont State libraries, or is that something that this bill might might foster through a better directory and inventory of our, of our libraries in the state? Well, this is wonderful research. I will let Tom McMurdo go into this area, and I am sure the Dean of Libraries at UVM would also want to weigh in on this. But I will say, interlibrary loan has definitely transformed access and information to a lot of these communities, because when you can't find it in your library, you're able to access it somewhere else, including out of state, and if needed, internationally by a network that we all kind of join, if you can afford it. But I will let Tom McMurdo discuss the uniqueness, because he oversees our interlibrary loan program and the uniqueness of it, along with the university systems and public libraries and school libraries and a few museums. Mr. McMurdo, please, uh, your thoughts on that as well as the bill in general. Yes, thank you. Um, so to cover the interlibrary loan question, this uh, the structure of this bill will not directly affect our work doing interlibrary loan. Interlibrary loan is one of our main charges at the Department of Libraries. So we oversee the technological system that allows that to happen between libraries. That free flow of information is very much a an important piece of the work that we do. So our goal is to make sure that if you walk into a library in um, uh, Lowell or in Burlington at the Fletcher Free Library, that you have access to essentially the world's resources, which we can provide through interlibrary loan. We can find those resources online and deliver them. So there's a lot of different ways that we are uh, helping with information in, um, in the state of Vermont. And that's everything from assisting people with uh, business information. Uh, sometimes that competitive information is information we can get for them that they can't get themselves. Uh, we also provide space in uh, libraries uh, for meetings, uh, various other sort of um, hoteling. Think of that as a, certainly a value um, pre and post COVID, right? Um, but uh, 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 Mr. Chair, to, advance, to address your question about the bill, uh, I, I have several thoughts about it. I concur certainly with everything that Jeanette, Jason, um, and Bruce have said so far. I would just add a couple things, which are the obvious question, which is why do we need a study bill if we're the Department of Libraries? Well, um, right, shouldn't we know our business, right? That's a great question. Um, well, we do. We interact with um, all of these libraries, over 500 in the state, uh, with some regularity with all of them, some more than others, obviously. Um, but the ability, the great thing about this study is it will give us a, a way to kind of pull in and organize that information, to hear it directly from those people at those libraries and also the public perception of those libraries and the information as we get it. So it's going to do a number of good things for us. Uh, the collection of that data can help dr us uh, drive our services to better meet those needs in a more 
uh, targeted way so we can put our resources be to better use in the future. And um, of course, in libraries, we're all about being data driven. Uh, those collection decisions are about, you know, who's, has this book been checked out in five years? Well, it's time to go. If it hasn't. Uh, also, other services that we offer are, are, are the programs that we're offering having impacts. And um, so this study will, will kind of fill in some of that back end that while we do try to collect that data, it will be in a serially organized way that can help us have data that will drive uh, our services for hopefully many years to come. Um, I would also add that, um, as Jason mentioned, that th the gathering of this information will assist us in designing new standards. Um, our last standards uh, that were actually passed by the legislature are from 1986. So um, that's pre-computer almost. I mean, some of us remember having a TRS-80 or an Apple II from way back when and those big floppy disks, but we're a long way from there now. So a lot has happened since then. So that's gonna help us be able to create those new standards. Uh, this bill will, will directly dovetail into that process for us that we would pick that up following that. Um, so I, I believe that's an added benefit to that. Um, one comment I might add, and uh, Jason could tell me to uh, retract if necessary, but in the makeup of the committee, I would love to see the two assistant state librarians added to that group because we're, we're going to be at all the meetings anyway. So it might be nice for us to have uh, the ability to interact a little more directly with the committee um, since we're going to be such a big part of that. And then finally, um, Libraries in many places are the de facto town center. We saw that um, during Irene, where a lot of emergency services were coordinated out of the library. Um, this study will give us the ability to kind of gauge where we are in terms of the value of those libraries and those communities, get a little more feedback about that. We do know that they are, they are vitally important to many towns in Vermont, but um, kind of helping to give people a voice as well in terms of um, being able to talk to the state. And I think that's important. I think that most of our libraries do feel comfortable talking to us, but giving them the chance to have an official voice and to be recognized in this way would be very useful for us. So thank you for uh, letting me um, outline those uh, thoughts. Pleasure and thanks for being here. Uh, any questions before we turn to uh, Professor Geffer? Wonderful. Uh, professor, you're going to surprise us and tell us you're against the bill, uh, or <laughs> resolutely opposed. Yes. Right. Thanks for being with us. Uh, for uh, looking yeah. forward to hearing your thoughts on it as well. Yes, and thank you for having. Me. I, I think it's a great bill, and I think a study of this sort is is all for the good. I'm I'm really happy to be part of a state that's undertaking something like this. Um, I did have a few thoughts. I'll, I'll preface them by saying that um, I really defer for the majority of thoughts to Mr. McMurdo and Mr. Broughton and Ms. Schaefer, who are far more plugged into the state library system than I am. So I'm, I'm speaking a bit from the periphery. Um, but a couple of thoughts. One is that recognizing that I do speak from the periphery, I hope that this group can ask hard questions about whether academic libraries ought to be on the periphery as they are now. It, it seems to me that the University of Vermont is the state's flagship institution and as a land grant institution has a fundamental obligation to serve the state and that the university's library has a fundamental obligation to serve the library community. And so in observing that we are on the periphery, I hope that one of the questions that this committee can take on is, is there more that the state can ask of the university and its library? And is there more that we can contribute, contribute to the state? Um, so that's one thing. Um, the second observation is um, this, this bill is asking the committee to answer a number of really good questions. It seems to me that there's one big question that I couldn't quite locate in the bill, and I was trying to figure out how to put this, and, and I think it's, it's this. Do libraries in the state of Vermont provide access to the sorts of literature, scholarship, 
research that's necessary for an informed citizenry to be engaged and productive. Now that's a really hard thing to measure. That's, that's, that's a question that's more easily asked than it is answered. But it seems to me that it's a question worth asking in this process. And, and you can think about this question in all kinds of different ways. If I'm sitting in my kitchen in Rutland and hear a story on NPR's Morning Edition that references a study just published in The Lancet, will my community, my state, my library community, get me a copy of that article if I want it? And how do I go about doing that? If I'm listening to something about climate change and I have questions and I want to track down the latest um, good research on that information, can I get ahead of that? What kinds of structures do we have in place? So if, if there's a way to, to note that question in the bill, or at least as an understanding among the, the task force members, I think that's worth asking. The, the final two observations um, revolve around um, Mr. Anderson's observation that some of the um, lines say that the committee may do such and such, and others of them say that they shall do such and such. There were two mays that I wonder if it would be worth making shalls. Um, and those two are, um, it says the committee may include an assessment of how libraries may best share resources across differing libraries. It seems to me that that's a really important question and it might be worth um, requiring the committee to ask that question rather than leaving it up to the committee. Um, just a thought. The other is it says that the committee may examine models for library management and organization in other states. There is a lot of really interesting stuff happening in other states, fascinating, disparate, wildly divergent models in other states for how libraries cooperate and work together. And whatever solutions this committee ends up recommending, I think it would really behoove the committee to acquaint itself with the various things happening in other states. If, if only to reject parts of them, I think the, the ultimate recommendations would be stronger for having considered them. So those are my thoughts. Very, very helpful. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, questions for, for uh, Professor Geffert or for any others? Senator Hooker. Just a quick one. When did Bailey Howe become Howe? And, and yeah, just before my arrival, which was about two years ago. Um, so I, I was not part of that. Um, it was a controversy over the fact that um, Bailey was a fairly well-known and active eugenicist and the university decided to remove his name. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one question, I, I'm not sure who best to pose it to, but this committee has been, uh, and will continue to look at civic education. Uh, we're uh, gonna be returning to this topic on the 23rd when our agency of education is coming back with an overall assessment of how uh, K through 12 experiences civics, learns civics, uh, and some, some perhaps some advice on how the legislature can be helpful. The other topic that will be of interest to all of you is literacy. You know, we have, um, no matter how you cut it, uh, looking at scores, they're not great uh, when students reach third grade. We're trying to make improvements in that regard. Tell me how you all are working on those two issues uh, or how you might be partners on those. Mr. Broughton. Thank you, Chair. I can definitely answer that. Um, know that this was a unique question um, from a counterpart of yours in a budget hearing that I had prior to this meeting from Senator Kitchell mm -hmm. regarding because we were discussing one of the nuances in our budget where this year, for the first time ever, um, I would hope that all of you have heard of the summer reading program at your local library that is done every year. It's usually done in print. Um, once COVID hit, we made the quick decision to do some interesting things. We took some of our federal money and we bought a subscription to what is known as Beanstack. So summer reading went virtual for the first time ever in Vermont. And what that will allow over time is the study of data without giving out confidential information. You can assess reading levels 
primarily for leisure reading during the summer at a certain level, which will allow you to kind of cross-reference if we wanted to with the Agency of Education. What are children doing over the summer when it comes to reading? Are we helping to diminish the uh, summer slide, as they like to call it? Along with this subscription allows us to have reading challenges any time of the year. It doesn't have to be summer reading only. We have launched a winter reading program. And so our goal is to work a little bit closer with the agents of education on the role of literacy at all levels, including adults, which will come in time. But our biggest goal is going to be children and youth. And so that is one of our aspects from a literary side to kind of standardize and also we are working with AOE when they immediately went virtual and with connections to Vermont Public Radio and also PBS, we were afforded opportunities to go to training. So our libraries are also training with the educators. There's always been an interesting request from libraries across the country of almost any caliber to understand the local school. And what that means is the librarians in this state have slowly come, um, some of them are already doing it, but a lot more have asked us, but we're kind of interested to know what is the curricula? How can we kind of help with that in all levels? So we are working with them. Um, primarily it's in Jeanette's area and she can afford a little bit more information if she would like to on this, on what we're doing to kind of connect more with education and help the library understand some of the needs that might be addressed if they can address them based on um, curricula, topic, and subject. So it's going to be in some cases school librarians working with the public librarian and in other cases school librarians, the teacher and the public library. And I think we have two cases in the state where we actually have a school librarian, a public library, and an academic library, which to me is a crown jewel, all working together to show a pathway of why a library is important in your life, cradle to grave. Because right now, we're probably all using the public library as our secondary. But if you're going to go to college, you need to access a college library. I can tell you, I didn't learn a college library system until I got to the front desk and I said, I have a paper due tomorrow. And she says, sit down, stop crying, we'll help you out. So I didn't know how to work that. No one does till you get to college. So I think showing progression will assist the department in showing how can we have a more literate system of people who are educated and democratized. But that is a dream. And I'm open to having as many stakeholders assist us in that effort because we see that um, we don't talk as much as we would like with the academic community. We do provide services, but we could certainly in a sense examine what we could do more. The other thing, I don't know if Senator Kitchell mentioned this to you, but uh, we've been talking also about just, and you touched on this a little bit, but opportunities this summer and making certain that as much as we possibly can make, perhaps if, if we can make as many of these programs uh, free through CARES money. So programs that are offered at libraries um, and, and other groups hopefully will have you know, robust attendance. And I would Ooh, just- I can you. add one more then when you said that. Jeanette, do you want to talk about the um, wonderful thing we did with a portion of our federal and our CARES Act money? regarding movie licenses, this will come as a surprise to you because we offer this to public libraries, but we did so because what happened to school under COVID. Sure, if I may, Mr. Chair. Of course, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, so thanks to the CARES funding, we were able to buy movie licenses available to every school in the state uh, that allowed the, the teachers there to assign streaming movies to students to watch at home um, to help them with a flipped classroom model where maybe they could watch a movie before they had a lesson on that movie or um, they could they could have the lesson first and then go home and watch the movie as well and um, this this was a, a real improvement for the the schools and the options that they had uh, with options is with with um, assigning some of the tasks to the students at home and using their in-person time, which of course was limited at the beginning of COVID uh, to really working through their lesson plans and, and the lessons. So that was a, a great thing we were able to add thanks to CARES for the schools. Um, we do make these movies available, not streaming, but in library viewing to public libraries as well. And they were able to show movies out on their property outside the summer 
and move some of their programming out and uh, really enhance their services and their and what they were offering in their communities. The other thing, um, speaking of literacy that Jason uh, hadn't mentioned is our book awards. So we, um, we offer three book awards uh, across all age ranges. So we start with picture books and go all the way up to teen book awards and their reader choice awards. So the students, uh, we have committees make a selection, nominate books, and the students then pick their top choices. And we have those across all ages. And these really uh, engage students. They are excited about reading. There's a little bit of a peer pressure element going on where they, they, they all compete other to read every single book that was nominated and um, we we hear from the students anecdotally that the book awards are uh, the things that really get them excited even uh, young males who tend to not be big readers are challenged in these in these book award um, seasons that we offer so that's another thing I wanted to add Thank well you. I would like to just add what they are um, so you have the red clover followed by the new item, which for some was controversial because we renamed the Dorothy Canfield Fisher Award, which is now called the Vermont Golden Dome Award, voted on by the children of Vermont. I will say up front, I was very terrified of letting the children vote because when you turn it over to kids, we could have got Bodie McBoatface. Didn't know what was gonna happen, but we trusted the children and they came through remarkably. <laughs> Our last one is the Green Mountain Book Award, which is for the youth. Uh, this has been a, an incredible conversation. Um, it, it's uh, libraries are so important. Uh, all of you are incredibly important to all of us and, and the children and adults uh, in our state. So thank you for everything that you're doing. We look forward to continuing this partnership uh, as we again look to increasing literacy, civic education, um, just again, being a wonderful resource uh, for communities, being a safe space. Um, and uh, so thank you. Uh, any other final uh, committee questions or comments? Senator Perschler. Uh Yeah, just thank you for, for the work. And if anybody doesn't know about Bodie McBoatface, they should go to their local library and look it up because it's a great, Great story. Good, that's great. Yeah, no, that's terrific. Okay. Thank you all. You're Thank welcome. you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, committee. Um, let's see. Uh, does anyone, and I'm looking to Senator Perchlick uh, in particular as having been here for this bill in the past, um, Anybody see any uh, concerns, uh, red flags, any reason um, people not interested in, in advancing this? Uh, anybody want to kill it? No. Okay, good. Got Senator Chittenden. I don't want to kill it, but I just want to say, no, I love libraries. And uh, I think this is well worth moving forward. And the fact that it went through last year, but COVID paused it uh, gives me reason to say, let's, uh, let's charge forward. Yeah, yeah, Senator Perschler. I was just gonna, for committee interest, I didn't know that the committee had anything to do with libraries when I got on it and, and Philip Ruth pointed out and I, and I noticed at the time that each committee has a jurisdiction sentence at the big top. If you go to each committee's website, which I had never noticed before. Um, and in our jurisdictions, libraries and scientific stuff, there's something else in there. Uh, and that's what generated the idea with Senator Hardy, she's like, oh, I didn't know we could do stuff with libraries. And then she took off from there. But uh, just if you're ever wondering what jurisdiction each committee has, you can always look at that little sentence there. I, that, that's great. I, I'm not sure if I have ever looked at that sentence. Uh, so, so that's terrific. Uh, we can okay. do scientific studies too. Right, right, right. So uh, what I would ask, uh, senators to do is uh, think about this tonight. Is there anybody else that you would like to hear from? Um, this is certainly important to Senator Hardy. I think we all agree it's, it's, it's a great step. Um, and uh, if, if we wanna hear from anybody else, we can certainly put uh, hear from additional people. 
Um, I think there were a couple of comments that uh, Jim will hope I'll point out to Jim to see if we want to make any uh, edits. Um, and if anybody else has any edits or suggestions, you know, during our, our next discussion uh, about the bill, please feel free to bring them up. But uh, I'm not anticipating uh, any controversy. Senator Lyons. Yes, uh, just the your initial comments when we before we looked at the bill uh, included the idea that this could be added to a miscellaneous education bill. So may, we probably should consider that. I don't know what else would be in a miscellaneous bill, but I mean this one to me feels like it's it's very important um, yeah. to the libraries of the state, but I think it's also important to us. So we should decide. Yeah, I, and I, I'm, I'm completely, you know, completely yeah. open to those kinds okay. of things, whatever uh, direction uh, centers want to go in. I did ask, uh, and it may not fit. In other words, you, it, uh, I've asked Senate Secretary French to come in next, I believe Wednesday or Thursday with his ideas, his needs from the agency with miscellaneous ed. Um, and if it is, as new senators will find, if it is punctuation and, and getting rid of old statutes, it, it might not feel right to plop a couple of other things in there. But then again, it, it might be the way that the committee uh, wants it to go. But I do respect, uh, and I'm sure we all do, you know, we all put in a lot of time and energy into different bills and, and want to, um, you know, celebrate that, that process. And, so Senator Hooker, please. I just would like some clarification on the parts that came from the House and, you know, whether or not we're going to incorporate them um, in this bill and or which of them we need to incorporate, which are going to be, you know, left out. Okay, sure. Okay. Terrific. Um, any other final questions or comments? Uh, it looks like, I don't know if, what it's like in the center or northern part of the state, but the sun is just amazing. The days are getting longer. Um, I know, I, so hopefully everybody can can get out, enjoy yourselves, families, uh, et cetera. Anything else? Senator Chittenden. I don't want to keep us long, but I was intrigued by a comment Bruce Post made about their role in the library organization when they get to it named geographic places. It's been raised multiple times that Vermont could do better at honoring our indigenous people naming conventions uh -huh. and spaces. I don't know if that falls within the education committee's domain, but it's certainly something that's piqued my interest. Yeah, that's really interesting. Senator Hooker, please. Well, and Senator Lyons can speak to this because we did it last year in institutions. Um, they also, I believe, used to name uh, have jurisdiction over naming buildings, but or no, um, it, I'm, am I getting confused, Senator Lyons? Oh, Mr. Post is here. And he I think Senator Lyons might want to say something first. Go ahead, Senator. Yeah, no. Wait, sorry, it, it, it wasn't buildings, it was roads, um, but we did have I'm trying to remember what we had a, a request for a, a pond or a lake recently that the um, board of uh, maybe uh, Bruce Post can tell us which one it was. Well, well, first of all, we have we don't have a um, uh, a mandate to consider indigenous names, but we have uh, we've named two sites uh, with Abnaki names: Miskashkik Brook, which means red spruce. Uh, up in Plainfield, and we did Sokoki Falls in, near Rockingham, and Sokoki was the eastern band of the Abnaki. One of the issues we have before us now is whether Negro Brook uh, in Townsend uh, should be changed. We have an active petition before us, and uh, we've taken some testimony. Uh, we couldn't complete the testimony. We decided in conjunction with the petitioners at our January meeting, to put off any consideration of having a special meeting until our next meeting in April. Uh, so uh, it's raised a number of issues. Uh, actually, um, uh, I won't go into all of them here, but uh, I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, I've learned a lot. And uh, with, with I, somebody asked about the most unusual library. Uh, let me just 
maybe send you away laughing, hopefully. Uh, I was on the select board of Essex. And when I was on the select board, our librarian at the Essex Free Library came with a request for a, a toilet seat. And I asked her, a toilet seat? And, you know, they say libraries do everything with a lot of different things. We're at the intersection of uh, uh, Vermont Highway 15 and 128, so there's a lot of traffic. Uh, she said a lot of UPS drivers and vendors use the bathroom a lot. Uh, the board wasn't sure whether they wanted to fund a toilet seat. I went home, told my son, he says, I'll buy it for him. But they ended up with a new, brand new toilet, water efficient. And uh, I don't think it's being used right now. But that was the most unusual request I ever remember. <laughs> Very interesting, indeed. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, as Senator Perslick, did you have a... a you, you... Well, I thought uh, just on the Abenaki names, the institutions, yep. what they did last year was encouraged, the way I remember, Forest and Parks to include Abenaki, Abenaki names alongside maybe the current... Right. On signage, yeah, exactly. Uh, so an act, so a translation of, of, the, of the name. Right. To uh, have bo both names up. Um, it's not a translation. Yes. They're not... No, it's not but no. It would be the, the Abnaki the name. English name and the Ag Abnaki name. Or it could be a French name in it. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you all.